from mistakes. There's a big EMP coming in. They get Jonex save. He'll be very low. A kill from Gamsu. Neko helping out. They're pushing New York back. Neko going crazy, and that's going to be Boston. They will defeat the New York Excelsior. I know that surprised a lot of people in here. How about you? Did you see that outcome? Uh, no, to be honest. <laughs> The second week of Stage 3 was a tumultuous week for the Boston Uprising, to say the least. Shameful external controversy saw mistakes forced into a starting DPS role, despite having only appeared on stage five times prior for individual maps mostly against opponents in the lower half of the standings. With the odds stacked entirely against them, the Uprising managed to thwart all expectations and hand the top two teams in the league a loss in Stage 3. An unprecedented effort as no team had ever taken down both of these giants in the same stage, yet Boston were able to pull it off with just a week between matches, as well as taking a win over the Seoul Dynasty shortly thereafter. But how exactly were they able to pull off the biggest upset of the season? Well that's just what we're here to break down in this week's episode of the Armchair Analyst series. If you're new here, feel free to subscribe so you never miss a day of content, but with that, let's jump right into the analysis. Heading into their matchup with the Uprising, NYXL were boasting an 11 series win streak, having not been felled even once since their meeting with the London Spitfire in Stage 2. On the opposite side of the stage, as we well know, Boston was starting with mistakes for the very first time. Now it's one thing to transition into a starting role after having been a substitute for months prior, it's another to do so on barely a few days notice, and it's an entirely different ballgame to make your starting debut against the number one team in the league. Throughout this entire video, it's worth keeping in mind two important factors. Firstly, that Boston had very little time to acclimate to having mistakes in the starting DPS role. Without focusing on the irredeemable acts of a former teammate, Boston essentially had to adjust their state of practice at the very last minute in order to accommodate for a new player, as it's likely mistakes saw very little scrim time in the past. Many in the community were even suggesting the very first implementation of a bye week for a team, given the extraordinary circumstances at hand. The second factor is that NYXL had a tough game to close out the week against the Houston Outlaws, a team that had pushed them to their absolute limits in the past. New York's coach even took to Reddit following the series against Boston to underscore the notion that the team had indeed overlooked the uprising and were entirely unprepared for the challenge in that series. An understandable decision to want to focus efforts elsewhere when in all likelihood, the Boston team could have come out playing their worst series to date given everything that had happened. So with that in mind, jumping into the first map of the series, Boston actually held an undefeated record on Volskaya, one of only two teams in the league to achieve such dominance with the other being Seoul Dynasty. That certainly gives them the edge going into the first map on paper, but obviously those previous wins were under much different circumstances. Now getting into the analysis, the underlying theme throughout this first map is patience. Kicking things off, we see mirror compositions in play as some excellent target selection comes out from Striker. Pressuring into the mega health pack room, Striker lands the pulse onto Ark just as he acquired Valkyrie. So patience was the crucial element here as a near 2 minute, drawn out engagement ends with Boston finding the most important kill at the most opportune time. The underlying strategy continues to prove effective as once again, we see Boston playing rather patiently as they approach point B. More often than not, after a team acquires point A, we see them dive directly into point B and attempt to catch their opposition off guard and cause a snowball effect. However, Boston play things differently as they're clearly aware of the fact that NYXL had a huge ult economy stored up. Paying mind to this, NYXL did indeed have 5 ultimates stored up for the fight and despite using all of them in relatively quick succession, they only managed to find a single pick for their investment. Just look at how patiently Boston play this. They lure out the dive from Janus, lure him to critical health to force out the primal rage, and repeat the exact same pattern for Mecho as they force out the self-destruct as well. It's remarkable just how much Boston were able to make of this fight, with so little going in. Funnily enough, you could probably take that statement and apply it to the series as a whole. Now moving into the attack run of New York, it's fascinating to pay attention to just how much Boston were able to negate the impact of Sabiorbi. As a matter of fact, arguably the best tracer in the league was stunted to the point where he actually only attained a single elimination or map. That alone is something I don't think any team has ever been able to pull off against New York in the past. Certainly not with that degree of efficiency. And it's a testament to how comfortable Boston are in Volskaya. They're able to apply pressure and retreat at will better than any other team. At this point in their offensive effort, with just over 2 minutes left on the clock, Boston had won their first engagement and were advancing to point B. 
For New York, 120 seconds have passed and they have yet to even so much as touch the point, let alone find a pick. Well what can that be attributed to? Looking at an overhead view, it's easier to comprehend just how Boston pressures their opposition when necessary. Whenever New York leave themselves exposed in common sightlines, they have mistakes providing the callouts to his team as well as taking scalps if he can find them. Meanwhile, Gamsu essentially patrols between both main paths of entry, dealing minor poke damage to members of NYXL that peak, whilst diving into supports in the backline when the situation calls for it. Sabiorbi's job here is basically to flank by any means necessary and make his way to where supports are almost always positioned on the defensive side of things on Volskaya, yet he's simply unable to in the allotted time due to how difficult Boston are making it for him to sneak by. Absolutely tremendous display of coordination here as Boston knew exactly what they were aiming to achieve and positioned themselves accordingly in order to counter the pick-based dive composition. Combined, Boston's tanks died a total of four times throughout the entirety of the battle on Volskaya. In contrast, New York's two tanks died a total of 15 times. That's incredibly staggering when you consider that the former contributed to a total of 36 eliminations. When you extract that number and observe the map as a whole, Boston accrued 36 kills all up, meaning that the tanks played a key role in the vast majority of eliminations, leading them to a rather emphatic first map win. As the series continued to play out, New York took Nimbani by force but only narrowly secured their second map win on Ilios thanks in large part to the return of Pine. So let's jump ahead into Junkertown as we see Boston executing on a rather irregular strategy all the way through to the third phase of the map. It's an extraordinarily rare sight when a team opts for a composition with only a single support hero, even more so on this map in particular and Boston managed to make it work all the way through to the second checkpoint. This is a bold strategy due to the limited self-healing available as well, but it definitely proved efficient as Kallax acquired 6 Valkyrie ultimates in comparison to the 4 that came out from Ark, despite the same playtime. Whilst obviously that increase can be attributed to the fact that Kallax didn't have to share the healing with the Zenyatta until much later, it's still an important statistic to note as on average, Kallax was far more impactful when ulting in teamfights. Not only did he resurrect more players than Ark, but he also kept his teammates alive more so than New York's 2 healers did for their team. And when the difference between opponents is truly razor thin, when there's only 5 eliminations separating Boston and New York at the end of Junkertown, it is the most minute factors that edge one team over the other, and in this instance, one of those key factors was indeed Kellex stepping up in this unique composition and outclassing one of the best Mercy players in the world in Ark. Clearly a strategy that Boston had practiced and called upon for this specific moment in time, and it paid off as it led Boston to a 5th map against the team atop the overall rankings. Moving into that 5th map, New York held a record on Oasis of 5 wins and only 2 losses, in line with other control maps in the game as by far their most successful map type with 29 wins and 11 losses in total. Now obviously an argument can be raised here as to whether or not it's entirely fair for tiebreaker maps to always take place in the control genre, it's evident that certain teams are better than others in that regard, but diving back into the series at hand, it's crucial to note that Boston are no slouches in the control game type either, with 27 wins and 13 losses to their name. Obviously it was shaping up to be an incredible final map, but let's look at just how Boston were able to win two phases in a row against one of the most dominant control teams in the league. Standing out amongst the pack is Neko, who put on one of his best performances to date. Supports often go underappreciated unless you happen to be Jonak of course, but the Omnic healer on the side of Boston significantly outperformed the most lethal Zenyatta. At 11 kills and only 2 deaths, he contributed to just under 25% of his team's kills. That's more than what even Note and Gamsu contributed on D.Va and Winston at 8 and 9 kills respectively. He also charged his ultimate a massive 20 seconds ahead of his opposite in Jonak. That's absolutely huge and signifies how Boston were able to continue thriving against NYXL who seemed really caught off guard in this final map in particular. Enabling Neko, Boston's first employed strategy on the map saw that NYXL would come to them, meaning that they lured out their opponents and dived in when they wanted to. Boston dictated the pace of the engagements and as Doa said, they crushed New York throughout the better part of this first map. Again, in the second instance of Oasis, it was patience that proved key. As we later saw in their series against the London Spitfire, Boston is sensational in their ability to stall out an objective, especially in regards to this control point on Oasis where Striker and Mistakes came in clutch to keep their dreams alive. And we see it again here as well against New York, as whilst for the most part, NYXL did find quite a few kills in every approach, Boston were just superior in stalling out the control point, constantly evading danger and staggering their appearances on point frustrating NYXL in the process. New York's final engagement is all but entirely predicted as Boston forced them to panic and waste ultimates. 
Mistakes forces out the Transcendence from Jonak as the point rolls into overtime. It's clear that the Transcendence achieves very little and Boston go on to close out the final frantic engagement as a result, demonstrating their control over the top team in the league and proving their worth as they now sit atop the Stage 3 rankings undefeated and will likely continue their reign of dominance through Week 4 where they meet the Shanghai Dragons and Dallas Fuel. So what did you think of Boston's effort against NYXL? Was it a hard fought win or were NYXL seriously out of sorts as they overlooked the opposition? Do you think the Uprising could become the first team to complete a full stage without a single loss? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below but as always, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.